They say in the entertainment industry you're supposed to eat the microphone. <laughs> the Seafood Newberg was a lot better than the <laughs> microphone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for inviting uh, the NRA to participate in today's uh, luncheon and meeting. Uh, David Keene sent his uh, uh, very heartfelt apologies that he was unable to attend uh, when I just recently received the, uh, the, no the, the request from his office over at the NRA's sixth floor asking me if I would pinch hit. I said, well, you're asking about apples and oranges. Mr. Keene is, is a past president. Uh, he is you know, a, a political uh, animal. Uh, he's the editorial uh, director of the uh, Washington Times newspaper, and they probably in Maryland, given the uh, given the current crisis in the uh, old line state, uh, would prefer to hear somebody to talk about uh, the enemy at the gates. Uh, and as a museum curator, a mild-mannered museum curator, um, <laughs> who works for a 501c3 tax-exempt institution, of which you all may uh, generously donate tax-free to, at any, there are brochures at the exit door, uh, seriously. Um, I was prohibited uh, by our internal revenue service from being able to talk about such uh, current events in the old line state. Um, so they said, well, all right, and they went to try and find somebody else immediately, and uh, that person couldn't, do, they came back to me again. So I said, well, how about if I talk about history? And maybe, subliminally, I'll work in something that might be of use in your current crisis. So uh, to start off with, uh, we talk about history at the National Firearms Museum, where I've enjoyed the pleasure of working uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, back when we were at the NRA's old location at 1600 Rhode Island Avenue uh, to our new location in Fairfax, Virginia, where we've been since 1994. The museum itself uh, will celebrate its 80th anniversary next year uh, in Fairfax, uh, 80th anniversary uh, will be celebrated at the Fairfax location. Uh, but more about the, uh, the museum uh, and some of our current things in a little bit, it's uh, history that we tell and try to interpret for our nearly 50,000 visitors a year that come through the Fairfax location. And we're also very proud to say that we open a new museum at the uh, Bass Pro headquarters store in Springfield, Missouri, uh, August before last, and that's garnered 375,000 visitors in its first year of being open to the general public. Uh, so we're out there and we're making uh, the connection uh, with members and non-members alike as to the history and the heritage of firearms. Because it was uh, Santa Ana who once said uh, that those who forget history are, are condemned to repeat it. Now that Santa Ana uh, was Jorge Agustin Nicolas Ruiz de Santa Ana y Boras. Not to be confused with the Mexican general Santa Ana, Antonio de Paula Maria Severino Lopez de Santa Ana Perez de Le Bon. Uh, two different guys. <laughs> One was Harvard educated and the other lost his leg at, at uh, San Jacinto. I'll let you figure out which was which. Uh, However, it's all about history, and one of the great things we talk about in the museum is the history that our, uh, our young, our young uh, youth of today uh, don't find in their history books. And the reason uh, that it's there now is because there were questions that I raised uh, in, in trying to put the museum together as to why I wasn't taught this in my history books uh, when I was growing up right here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, although I, I'm a native Washingtonian, I, uh, I, I grew up in Montgomery County and made good my escape uh, in my early 20s to the Old Dominion in Virginia. Uh, but these were questions that we wanted, that I had wanted to know, so we, we put them up in the museum. Uh, the first is, why exactly was it that General Gage sent nearly 700 men under Major Pitcairn and, and, and Colonel Smith out to uh, Lexington, Massachusetts the morning of April 19th, 1775. And what drew Captain John Parker and his 70 Minutemen to that little tavern in the end of the public parade ground there to stand and have him say to his men, do not fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to start a war, let it begin here. 
And so that fateful shot we call the shot heard around the world was exchanged that morning and the American quest for independence began April 19th, 1775. April 19th, 1861, as Lincoln would say, four score and six years previous to Lexington, Massachusetts troops embarked from a train station right here uh, where Camden Yard currently stands. And they were met by an angry mob of Marylanders who protested the armed soldiers of another commonwealth entering their sovereign territory of the state of Maryland. And as the famous song goes, the state anthem, and blood flecked the streets of Baltimore. You know, Maryland during this uh, Civil War, or war between the states, as we say, further south of the Mason-Dixon line, um, was quite a divisive issue right here in, in the old line state. 35,000 Marylanders wore gray during those four years. 60,000 wore blue. Truly brother against brother during those four years. Maryland had more injustices of civil liberty registered during those four years than I think in any period of American history before or since. You know that the state capital was forcibly moved under martial law from Annapolis to Hagerstown because Hagerstown was thought to be more of a uh, pro-union area. Anybody that was supposed to have spoken of secession was arrested and thrown into jail. And, and one neighbor could turn to another and say, that guy harbors southern leanings, and he would disappear in the middle of the night. That was all it took for one neighbor to turn in another, to the point where 3,500 Marylanders languished in Union prisons throughout the uh, course of the war. One of them, an attorney in Baltimore, uh, was able to petition another Marylander, Roger Tawney, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and an appellate a decision called Ex Parte Merriman to have the Lincoln administration issue a writ of habeas corpus, charge these 3,500 Marylanders with a crime, be it sedition or treason, but charge and indict them so that their trials can go on as stipulated in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution to a fair and speedy trial. The Supreme Court ruled in Merriman's favor. Lincoln's reply was, what army has the Supreme Court to enforce such a writ? Mine is called the Army of the Potomac. So he openly defied the Supreme Court, and those people stayed in jail long after Lincoln's funeral train returned him to Illinois. So it's these lessons that we try to teach uh, the museum. Oh, Gage in the uh, morning of the 19th. Written orders in Pitcairn's pocket telling his men to seize all stands of arms, ammunition, powder, and shot. These routine route marches have been made by the British for months, if not years, before the American Revolution actually began. Why was it that one morning that those guys lined up in that field and, and fired back? They were after their guns that day, specifically after their guns. They had not been after their firearms before that morning, but that was when it all began. And we go back to the Civil War and, and, and Maryland's part in that conflict. We're often told today that there were 650,000 casualties during the Civil War, making it one of the most bloodiest engagements militarily in this, this country's entire history. And that's both sides combined. Of course, we were all Americans, North or South, during the conflict. 650,000. On April, uh, on April uh, 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee issued General Order Number 9 to the Army of Northern Virginia uh, encamped outside of Appomattox Courthouse. He wrote, after four years of arduous service, unsurpassed by courage or fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. He put an end to the four-year struggle of Southern independence and ordered his men to peaceably lay down their arms and go back to rebuilding their country. Uh, quite a, uh, quite a, an admonition from a, what was considered a rebel leader uh, to an insurgent force in the field to peacefully lay this down to stop this bloodshed. But Lee didn't do so because he had been outfought tactically. 
he had just, as he says in his letter, he had been uh, suffering overwhelming numbers and resources. The Union Army outnumbered the Confederate Army 15, sometimes 20 to 1. As far as armament and production, they, they were hardly even comparable. The South needed to uh, bring in most of its uh, firearms from Europe. Uh, very few were produced in southern factories, while the North was able to produce at 33 different rifle factories, one and a half million copies of the 1861 model Springfield musket. 33 different factories, each one being able to supply the Army with the rifle that was fully interchangeable in parts. That's American industry. They were able to outproduce the South, out produce men to fight the South, and the South finally gave up. Now, when you look at the actual numbers uh, of dead during the war, a different picture begins to emerge. They didn't, ha they didn't have the ability to watch what was going on on the battlefield in real time like we do today. Uh, it took months, in some cases years, for the full scope of what took place at a certain battle or a certain campaign to actually become public knowledge. You can't read the newspapers of the time uh, with any level of uh, historical accuracy. Uh, they'll tell you anything. I don't think much has changed since, has it? Uh, after the Battle of Antietam, you can read how Lee was captured and Jackson was killed uh, in 1862 uh, in the New York Times of all places. Uh, so being able to get numbers to actually understand things that weren't just rumors or rumors of rumors was very difficult and it took some time, literally some years, for the, uh, for the government to issue the official records of the War of the Rebellion, uh, 1861 to 1865, 128 volumes. Um, sadly, I was born at the wrong time. I ended up purchasing all 128 volumes and filling an entire room in my house with them and then they come out on on DVD and, and all on one, <laughs> one damn disc, it cost $8. Uh, those numbers in the books, in the indexes, uh, paint a different picture of this hard-won victory. 150,000 Union dead as a result of battle injuries. That means if uh, the Battle of Antietam were taking place uh, 45 minutes to the west of here at Sharpsburg, at the end of the day, we're counting the number of men dead on the field that day, the number of men that would die of wounds within the weeks following. Uh, those battlefield fatalities caused by clash of arms, 150,000 Union dead total for the entire war. The Confederates had suffered only 75,000 battlefield dead during the war, a two to one advantage to the South under arms. These numbers as Union soldiers that stayed in the Army, the regulars, not the volunteers that signed up for quick bonuses and promotions and pay uh, and, they, and who left as soon as Appomattox, uh, the smoke cleared at Appomattox left, but these regular soldiers, the one who, who knew that the preservation of the Union now and forever meant etern eternal and everlasting vigilance they began to look at these numbers and realize that the South had really done a number on them, uh, that it was a near-run thing that they w lost the war and that the North won the war. Uh, and they endeavored to make something like that never happen again to where they would suffer such a disadvantage. So these six Union officers meeting in what I would like to envision was an oak paneled lined room similar to this, the Army and Navy Club of New York full of cigars and brandy, perhaps, sat down in November of 1871 and formed an association to promote rifle marksmanship throughout the branches of the service and to any interested civilian local rifle clubs throughout the country. And on November 17, 1871, they chartered the National Rifle Association of America in New York City. And here we are today almost 145 years later, uh, still going strong, still fulfilling our original promise uh, to make sure that rifle marksmanship and understanding and training is one of our primary objectives. And of course, our legislative work 
uh, goes hand in glove with that training and those marksmanship proficiencies. Now, uh, you got to remember that the NRA started a, a, a world uh, famous uh, phenomenon back there in 1871 when they had, when they inaugurated the the association, and this is about eight years before Samuel Clemens, writing under the name Mark Twain, would issue uh, Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Uh, where, remember where Tom got all of his friends to paint his fence white because he made it look fun, and that's what these generals did in New York. They got people to be interested in marksmanship because it was fun, and they and they they created. A, a sensation of rivalry and competition between the Army and the Navy and the 5th Regiment, the 7th Regiment, and the local clubs, of which there were many throughout this region and the upper Midwest, into a spirit of competition that you can see continues to this very day at Camp Perry, Ohio. So that's where the NRA came from, out of the, uh, the, the, the blood that flecked the very streets of Baltimore here in 1861, the quest for independence that began at Lexington Green that morning of April 19th, 1775. The National Rifle Association of America exists to this day and continues to do this work to educate, promote, so that this nation will never suffer again, uh, as we have in the past, a, uh, a lack of clarity uh, under arms. Now, the National Firearms Museum came about in 1935 as a result of our own uh, magazine, American Rifleman Magazine, uh, who gets that uh, mag or American Hunter or First Freedom? There we go. You know, I, I make our editors go absolutely pale when I tell them. In 1923, when Rifleman first came out, it was published twice a month. You know, they, they think about how hard it is to get a book out the door every 30 days. Back then, it was twice a month. Uh, but as industry uh, became to become aware of the burgeoning numbers of participants uh, through out the uh, country in, in, in marksmanship. In fact, by the 1880s, uh, a competition shooting at Creedmoor and at uh, Wembley and Bisley in, in Europe uh, was, the lar was the world's largest spectator sport. Can you imagine 15 to 20,000 people taking the Long Island Railroad out to Creedmoor to watch a shooting match at a thousand yard range where they lined both sides of the actual flight path of the bullet, all the way from the firing line to the backstop. That's how many people were there. That's great for windage. There's no, there's no wind to worry about. You've got a human blockade. But that's exactly how Frank Leslie's Illustrated News illustrated the phenomenon of, of competition shooting back in the 18, 1870s and 1880s. Um, the, uh, the museum uh, began, or the NRA and American Riflemen began to get rifles and pistols donated uh, from various institutions, uh, from individuals, from former presidents, and of course from industry uh, to illustrate the magazine and to write evaluations of these new guns. In fact, uh, looking at early American Riflemen ads is, is, is a lot of fun to see the different uh, types excuse me, types of guns uh, that were being flaunted by the, the manufacturers. Now, uh, the Colt ads feature uh, uh, Fitz, the, of the famous Fitz Special, working in his tent at Camp Perry, that great uh, police practical shooter, the, the father of police practical shooting, John Fitzgerald, an employee of Colt for 50 years nearly. Uh, wonderful ads and, and topics. Well, they would send these guns to the NRA, and, and well, we would keep them. <laughs> We'd still like to do that today, but there's a lot of paperwork involved. But back then, they would just send them to us. And we kept them. And they wanted us to because they thought that we could put them on, uh, uh, in, on the cover of the magazine or inside the magazine again when, whenever we wanted to. And we did. And that collection grew until 1935. It had become so large, they decided to, uh, to put it on display in the uh, bar building, uh, which is outside of uh, Farragut Square today. Uh, down in, in Washington, D.C. Directly across from the Army Navy Club of Washington, D.C. was the NRA headquarters. Still stands right there at Farragut Square. In the 50s, we moved up a few blocks to a Scott Circle, right across the street from the Australian Embassy. There's a Marriott Courtyard there today. Um, and we had a museum there from 54 until 94. And then in 1994, we moved across the river into the Old Dominion, Virginia. And we were able to take a museum that at its maximum uh, time in Washington had about 800 guns on display, and we put 3,000 
500 guns on exhibit. Uh, we were able to finally become a real museum that had a timeline, had a story, had themes to t uh, talk about and discuss. And it's a chronological history of man's uh, interaction with technology, uh, history, settlement, exploration, hunting, sustenance, all these different uh, or, uh, topics uh, from the first gun in about 1350 all the way up to the most modern gun that we can talk Glock or HK or Colt or Smith & Wesson out of sending us as they come off their production line uh, today. So we're very proud of, of what we have there. We think that it's a, uh, a tremendous uh, opportunity, especially for the young. Uh, in Virginia, we have something in our education system called the standards of learning. Every uh, child, uh, every student from kindergarten to 12th grade has to pass a certain battery of tests to be able to be promoted. The National Firearms Museum uh, qualifies with answers to 85% of the uh, social studies questions that are asked in K through 12 in the Virginia Standards of Learning. Uh, we've kind of woven the story of Virginia in with the, uh, the rest of the story of America. Uh, but it's these stories that we tell uh, at the museum. We're very fortunate uh, to have currently on display a loan from our own federal government. Uh, the Department of the Interior National Park Service uh, knew that when we originally built the new museum in 1998, that we had copied a room of Theodore Roosevelt's at Sagamore Hill, New York, uh, his library. We wanted to emulate Theodore, a life member, uh, one of the uh, initial proponents uh, of the uh, National Board for the Promotion of Rifle Practice. Uh, he, he meant so much to the NRA in hunting, uh, in, in sports shooting, conservation, we felt we had to uh, put something there to, to commemorate his, his, uh, his leadership. And so we copied his library. Uh, well, in 2011, Sagamore Hill called us and said, we have to close the house for a three to five year period so that we can rebuild it from the inside out, make it a true uh, sealed uh, archival uh, presence for the 10,000 artifacts that we have. Because they were dealing with a house that was built in 1885. And on Long Island Sound, you're gonna have spikes in temperature and humidity and snow and rain. And everything in the house was original. So they wanted to make it a sealed environment so, so the artifacts would long be preserved. And they said, well, we move everything out of the house. Would you mind yeah. taking some of our, our, our precious artifacts for us? And we, we literally jumped at the opportunity. Uh, we, we were able to, uh, to bring 115 uh, different items from the Roosevelt home and recreate his library in our facsimile library. So we actually have uh, the tunic, hat, and sword that he carried at San Juan Hill, his 95 Winchester carbine, an original Guston Borglum bust of Roosevelt sits on the, uh, on the mantelpiece, a, a bronze bust that Borglum did. You, you may not recognize his name, uh, but he later did a much larger bust of Roosevelt that's on Mount Rushmore in South Dakota today. Uh, the actual lion skins from his African safaris, his elephant foot trash can and rhinoceros foot inkwell, along with the regimental colors of the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, the unit that he commanded at San Juan Hill on July 1st, 1898, where he would later be awarded the Medal of Honor for his service and courage under fire that day. That regimental flag, hand painted on silk, was the flag, not the stars and stripes, but the regimental flag of his old unit that covered his coffin when he was laid to rest in January of 1919. So while these items and precious artifacts from our nation's attic are still at the museum for a few months more, I encourage you all to come down and visit us to take a trip through American history and the role firearms have played in not only securing our independence, but maintaining it ever since. For that, I thank you very much. <laughs>